Okay, well, hello everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm super excited for the hour we have ahead of us. I've been looking forward to it like all week. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. It's Reverend Dr. John Moore. He's a nationally renowned motivational speaker and a Dr. Martin Luther King dramatic impersonator. He's going to do two speeches for us today. Hello, Dr. Moore. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm originally from Philadelphia, so I feel like y'all making me feel like I'm at home. <laughs> so do you want me to start or, or? Yeah, whenever you're ready. Oh, oh I, that's what I was wondering. I didn't know that I was supposed to. So this, this first um, speech is very rarely heard by Dr. King. He uh, was speaking to an audience and he was talking about working hard in order to take advantages of the new opportunities that exist. And uh, I remember when I first heard this, he said some lines in there that were very profound and powerful. So one like this, he says, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson said in a lecture back in 1871, that if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. This will become increasingly true. That means we're gonna to have to work hard. We're gonna to have to burn the midnight oil sometimes. We're gonna to have to take advantage of new opportunities. But we must set out to do our life's work so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it better. We must set out to do a good job. We must not seek merely to do a good Negro job if you're setting out merely to be a good Negro doctor, or a good Negro lawyer, or a good Negro teacher, or a good Negro preacher, or a good Negro skill laborer, or a good Negro barber, or a good Negro beautician. You have already flunked your matriculation exam for entrance into the University of Integration. We must get ready. We must set out to do that life's work so well that nobody could do it better. Is that said so often? If it falls your luck to be a street sweeper, go to the sweet streets like Michelangelo carved marble. Sweet streets like Raphael painted pictures. Sweet streets like Beethoven composed music and like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweet streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. This is it. If you can't be the pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub on the side of the reel. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best at whatever you are. So I think that was a very powerful statement by Dr. King to really motivate people about working hard and doing their best. And then I'll leave you with this one, a very popular one that a lot of people listen to. I don't know how much time I have. Do I have a few minutes I could share this one? So I'm gonna take you a little deep on this one here. You know, y'all done got me rolling now. I got about like 30 of these things locked up in my head. But it was the last speech he gave called The Mountaintop. And a lot of people hear the part when he talks about I've been to the mountaintop. But what a lot of people don't hear often is when he talked about a life attempt that happened to him years earlier when he was autographing his first book. And it went like this. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. Let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make America what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make America a better nation. 
And I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. While sitting there autographing books, a black woman came up. The only question I heard from her was, are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down writing and I said, yes. Next minute I felt something beating on my chest. For I knew that I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. And that blade had gone through when the x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. Once that's punctured, you drown in your own blood. That's the end of you. Came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me after the operation, after my chest had been opened up and the blade had been taken out, to move around in the wheelchair of the hospital. And they allowed me to read some of the mail that came in and from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I'll never forget. I received a letter from the president and the vice president, but I've forgotten what those letters say. I had received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I've forgotten what that letter said. But there was another letter that came from a little girl, a young girl, who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter and I'll never forget it. it. Said simply, dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. He said, while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you would have sneezed, you would have died. Well, I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. Now I want to say tonight, now it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot stayed over the public address system. We're sorry for the delay. We had Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all of the bags were checked. And to be sure that nothing will go wrong on the plane, we've had to check out everything carefully. We've had the plane protected and guarded all night. Then I got into Memphis. Some began to say the threats or we'll talk about the threats that were out. Uh, what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? What do you what will happen now? We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't miss anything. Like anybody I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. He wants me to go to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I mean, I'm just with you. 
But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get you the promised land. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing heaven. I'm seeing the glory of the Christ of the Lord. And then you know from that speech, six o'clock the next evening, he was shot and he was killed. But because of great things like you're doing today with Venture Cafe from Philadelphia, A, my hometown, <laughs> by doing this, even though he's no longer here, we're able to keep the dream of Dr. King alive. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. McCorr. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And if you'd like to, I'd love if you would stay with us. We're going to go to our we'll, next speaker. We'll listen to Lynn, yeah. Perfect. And then we'll have Q&A at the end if you're available um, to yes. answer questions. So uh, our next speaker is Professor Lynn Washington. He is a journalist professor of investigative journalism, journalism law, and multi multimedia reporting at Temple University. He's a very busy guy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and then towards the end, I'll be happy to read them out to our presenters. So I will hand it over to you now, Professor Washington. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's uh, hard to uh, follow those stirring words. Uh, Reverend, Moore, uh, <clears throat> Reverend Moore, you're, you're terrific. Let me see if I can uh, bring up my uh, screen. Uh, so I have a, a, whoops, wrong thing. Oh, here we go. This is the right thing. You told us beforehand that you were just figuring this out, so we understand. <laughs> yeah, I, think I'm I hope you can see what I'm seeing. <laughs> uh, so I see your your Gmail. I think that you shared oh. um, just your Chrome. Um, so if you go back into share screen, you might see like something else uh, pop up. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, great. Perfect. All right. Still learning. <laughs> Maybe by the time I turn 80, I'll have all this done. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Dr. Martin Luther King and some of his formative years uh, in the uh, Philadelphia area. Um, this is an aspect of Dr. King's life that gets minimal ex um, examination by historians, but it had such a profound uh, impact on uh, his life and, and shaping uh, his philosophies, his energies, and, and other things. So uh, this is what uh, area I've been looking at since ooh, around, around the mid-1980s when I uh, wrote some articles for the Philadelphia Daily News, which I was working with at the time. Uh, as a um, As a professor, you know, I'm gonna to have to give you a quiz. <laughs> so I wanna start with uh, what city do you think uh, had uh, the, the most effect or a contributory effect on uh, Dr. King's life? Was it uh, Atlanta, Georgia? Or was it Montgomery, Alabama? Atlanta is where Dr. King was born. And some of his early writings, uh, particularly the writings that he did uh, while he was at the uh, Crozier Seminary in Chester where he attended after he graduated from Morehouse uh, in Atlanta and also at Boston University where he earned his PhD. He received a lot of honorary degrees, but he earned a PhD at Boston University. And he talked about some of his early childhood experiences, um, experiences where he, individu where he individually experienced uh, discrimination, including from some young people and also experiences like he said, seeing people in uh, soup kitchen lines and bread lines uh, during the depression. Of course, uh, Montgomery, Alabama is where he uh, led the famous Montgomery bus boycott. And that elevated him to national and international attention. Now, while the Montgomery boycott catapulted Dr. King into the national vision. His first protest was actually in Maple Shade, New Jersey. Maple Shade is a little small town about 13 miles uh, northeast of Philadelphia. It's in Camden County. 
And on a Sunday evening in June of 1950, Dr. King, his uh, Morehouse friend and also fellow seminarian named Walter McCall and their two dates that evening, including a woman named Pearl Smith, who was the second, uh, as they called it at the time, the second Negro, who was a, a police officer in the city of Philadelphia. Imagine that. Uh, the Philadelphia police force had been in existence uh, prior to the 1880s, and it wasn't until the early 1950s that they got a black female police officer. But Dr. King's protest was there. Uh, they went to a roadside cafe there uh, with the purpose of trying to make a point that segregation had to end. According to historians, and this is why I'm saying a lot of his life in this area gets short shrift by the historians, they claim that he was just driving down the road and decided to stop somewhere to get a sandwich. Um, people who were with him that night earlier, uh, where he was occasionally staying in Camden, he said that he wanted to go there specifically for a protest. Walter McCall said he went there specifically for a protest. King himself, uh, on a few occasions during his life, said he specifically went there for a protest. During that protest, the bar owner uh, chased him out of the bar, uh, firing a gun, not at them, but in the air. Uh, that led to Dr. King's first lawsuit against discrimination. And that lawsuit, interestingly enough, was filed on his behalf by the NAACP in New Jersey. Now, let's understand at the time, Dr. King was an unknown seminarian, but the NAACP in New Jersey took up his case. Uh, there were three newspaper articles, uh, one in a national, nationally distributed um, African-American newspaper, and two were in the Philadelphia Tribune, which is the oldest African-American newspaper in, in the United States. That particular discrimination lawsuit didn't get anywhere because the um, witnesses that he had uh, recruited, uh, University of Pennsylvania law students, uh, refused to come in and testify. They didn't want to um, injure their careers. So the Philadelphia area, and not necessarily his hometown in Atlanta, had a really a profound effect on um, uh, his life and his life's development. While he was here, he took courses at the University of Pennsylvania. He moved around. He had friends in the area. He talked with them. Uh, he talked with activists. Uh, but there was one particular occasion uh, that would have a really a lasting impact on him. And I'll get to that in a minute. Dr. King's first book, and I think um, uh, Reverend Moore had, had referenced this, that, that he was signing, uh, the, uh, signing the books when he was stabbed in Harlem. That book, Stride for Freedom, Dr. King acknowledged that until he got to Crozier, uh, he hadn't really thought about how to effectuate social change. And while there, he started a really deep uh, analysis of what he could do to help effectuate change. A part of that impetus that led to him thinking that way was the uh, impacts of uh, Reverend uh, Pius Barber who lived in uh, Chester, a uh, very important person in, the, in that town at that time, a personal friend of King's father. King spent a lot of time in uh, Reverend uh, Barber's uh, house. Reverend Barber's daughter, Elma Nina Barber, who at the time, uh, she was a college graduate at taught in uh, New York City, came back to the University of Pennsylvania and uh, was in the, uh, the law school at the time. She did a lot of advising to him on that first lawsuit. And she was the one who actually recruited the uh, people to um, go in and, and provide some evidence. But those, as I said, those people didn't come in and testify uh, at the trial. A few weeks before Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis in April of 1968, he was in Philadelphia. He was in Philadelphia to help raise funds and generate support for his poor people's campaign. He wanted to go into Washington, DC and have an encampment on the, I think it was the National Mall. And he wanted to raise the issue of economic inequality. Dr. King is seen throughout time as a civil rights activist, but what really, really drove him was silver rights. 
the fact that so many people in America uh, were suffering uh, due to a lack of income and lack of uh, economic uh, opportunity when he made his famous speech criticizing the Vietnam War, which caused him so much consternation when he made that speech in 1967. He made the comparison between the monies that were being dumped into the war and the monies that were not being dumped into a war on poverty in the United States. The first office for this Poor People's Campaign was actually in Philadelphia. And that office, or more specifically office space, was extended to him by one of his allies in Philadelphia, C. Dolores Tucker. And you can see her in the middle. Uh, you see John Lewis, uh, you see C. Dolores Tucker, you see Dr. King, and I believe that's his wife, I'm not sure, but I know that's Dr. King, C. Dolores Tucker, and uh, John Lewis. Uh, and throughout King's career, he would come into Philadelphia from time to time uh, get a lot of support. He had protests. Um, he actually was a part of the um, protests at the Girard College, uh, which helped desegregate uh, that institution. Now, I kind of intimated that there was something that happened to Dr. King in Philadelphia, specifically in Philadelphia, not Maple Shade, but in Philadelphia, that had a very profound effect on him. Dr. King was trying to find a way, a mechanism, to do protests and have that protest effectuate profound change. In November of uh, 1950, he attended a lecture at the First Unitarian Church in Center City. That's around, uh, it's on Chestnut Street, uh, a little bit east of uh, 21st Street. And the speaker that day was a guy named Mordecai Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson was a, a very um, energetic speaker a very popular and of import that particular day, Dr. Johnson had just returned from a trip to India where he himself had studied uh, Gandhi's uh, peaceful protest process. And Dr. King noted after hearing that, he said that he was so electrified uh, by hearing Dr. Uh, Johnson's words that he went out over the next couple of weeks and bought every book that he could find on Gandhi. And uh, as you can see from the um, church directory of the uh, Unitarian Church, uh, there's a listing there of uh, Dr. Um, Johnson speaking. Historians, and like I was saying how so historians kind of like brush over what happens here. They just say, well, he was in, uh, he heard Dr. Uh, Mordecai Johnson. They never gave a date. And that date was discovered actually just earlier this year, discovered and confirmed when a researcher from New Jersey, who I'll get to in a minute, uh, was doing some research at Temple University's um, library. I know that he was there doing it because I was there with him. Uh, we were going through the files of an organization called the uh, Fellowship House. And according to historians, Dr. King heard Mr. Johnson, uh, Dr. Johnson at the Fellowship House. But the Fellowship House was a small facility in North Philadelphia, uh, so it, uh, historians did not take the extra step to dig in to find out where it actually happened. The Fellowship House would give large gatherings or large programs at the Unitarian Church, not at their facility there. Dr. King was able to actually travel to India where he laid a wreath at the uh, tomb of um, Gandhi, uh, interacted with people who knew Gandhi and, and really absorbed and again was energized by that trip. His ability to get to India, it was Dr. King, his wife, Dr. King's um, uh, first biographer, uh, a historian named Dr. Lawrence Reddick, who taught at Temple for a brief time as he was traveling around in his academics. And Dr. Reddick was the one who actually wrote Dr. King's first biography. While in India, uh, through the auspices of the AFSC, which is a Quaker organization, he was escorted by a representative of that organization uh, who was living in India named Jim Bristol. And you see Jim Bristol all the way on the right in this photograph. Uh, Mr. Bristol, after he returned from uh, India, him and his wife lived up in Chestnut Hill. And I had the pleasure of being able to uh, talk with and interview uh, Mr. Bristol before his passing. 
Dr. King is identified with civil rights, um, but he really had a world perspective. He understood that the economic forces around the world were pretty much responsible for a lot of the economic inequities in the world. He early on uh, was an anti-apartheid activist. And this is another element of Dr. King that doesn't get too much attention. And it is said that his embracement of the anti-apartheid movement was due to the influence of activists in the Philadelphia area. In 1962, Dr. King called for an economic boycott of South Africa. That was something that the United States government did not adopt uh, until the mid 80s uh, over the objections of then uh, President Ronald Reagan. And it was a Philadelphia minister named, uh, and congressman named Reverend Gray, who was the one that uh, finally uh, had legislation go through uh, Congress calling for an economic boycott. You see this picture of Nelson Mandela and uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi actually started his activism in South Africa. He lived in South Africa uh, around the turn of the uh, 1900s. He worked there as a lawyer and he was against the past laws. And after he cultivated some of his activism in South Africa, he returned uh, to um, India. A uh, little factoid, there are more Indians living in South Africa than any other country in the world other than um, India. At the time when Dr. King issued this call for a boycott, he did it in conjunction with the then president of the ANC, a guy named Albert Latuli. It wasn't Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was a core and key member of the ANC at the time, but he wasn't the, uh, wasn't the president. King's achievements, uh, as we know, garner worldwide recognition. There is a forest in Israel named after Dr. King. There are monuments in Africa. There's monuments in, in Central America, Mexico. Uh, as you see here, uh, over the main door of Westminster Abbey are uh, what is called the martyrs of the 21st, or of the 20th century, excuse me. And it, right over the center, the center arch, slightly to the left, that's Dr. King. Um, in West Philadelphia, there's a state historic marker at the intersection of 40th Street, Haverford Avenue, and Lancaster Avenue, where they all come together. And in 1965, on literally a few hours notice that Dr. King was coming, 10,000 people came to that intersection to hear him speak. Uh, and that, that mural that you see in the background is representative of that. But interestingly enough, where Dr. King had his first protest and his first lawsuit, there's no st official state recognitions. That plaque that I showed you earlier a few minutes ago was put up there by uh, an individual in concert with Maple Shade, not by the state of um, uh, New Jersey. The individual that has been pushing to get recognition for Dr. King uh, in New Jersey is Patrick Duff. You see him being interviewed. And Mr. Duff is standing outside of a house now abandoned, but still privately owned in Camden, New Jersey. And that is the house where Dr. King stayed occasionally because that house was owned by relatives of Walter McCall, his, his good friend. And it was at that house on Sunday, June 12th, 1950, Dr. King announced that he was going to go to Maple Shade and hold that protest. Uh, the owner of the house and the owner's son tried to talk him out of it. Said, that's really a racist place. You really don't want to go there. And Dr. King said, it's time. We need to stop this. We need to do what we can to eliminate that. Interestingly enough, the uh, authorities in New Jersey have declined giving that house historic registry listing. There are 53 entities in Camden County that are on the registry of the state of New Jersey, including the house that belonged to the brother of the famous poet Walt Whitman. And of course, there's a, um, a listing for Walt Whitman who spent the last six months of his life in Camden. But these authorities say, well, that house is really of no big deal because Dr. King's first protest 
in Maple Shade was of what he said, quote, minimal historic importance. And as we all know, a first has its own importance because it's first. And one would think that the first protest that Dr. King did and the first lawsuit that he filed and that lawsuit was based on the first statewide anti-discrimination law passed anywhere in the United States, which was in New Jersey, would merit some attention. Um, so I ask you, is this a example of uh, blue state bigotry? Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to um, rant a little bit and I'll return the screen to your control, Lindsay. Thank you so much. I did not know any of that. So I really appreciate getting some new information about Dr. King. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I do have questions, but I don't want to. <laughs> um, I'd rather give someone else the opportunity if they have any. So does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Perfect. Um, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Lynn. Thank you, Brother Moore. This was absolutely incredible um, and, and sort of building off, their, off of uh, Mr. Lin's pre presentation. Brother Moore, would you be able to share a little bit of mm -hmm. your experience uh, with, with Dr. King and memorials, uh, <laughs> specifically the one in DC? Yeah, you know, I was just putting in the, I was just putting in the chat box that this is for Dr. Washington. I spoke in Maple Shade last year really? at Converge Church. And so before I spoke there, they took me to that monument. I, I took a picture with it and they explained the story. And what their whole purpose was of bringing me there is we brought about uh, four, 300, 400 people to that church, including all these different state political leaders. And uh, it was just amazing. So to hear you talk about that again, it just brought that back to life. And what my brother is talking about here, Gary, is that, you know, <clears throat> you know, I've been doing these speeches for over almost 27 years. And when they opened the Martin Luther King Memorial down in DC, uh, a great involvement in that was my fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, which is also Gary's fraternity. <laughs> and could you imagine this? This is somebody who's been doing these speeches and loving it. And I actually got to be on stage on August 26, 2011, when they first opened it. It was supposed to be the official opening weekend. You may remember that August 28th was going to be the big event, but then a storm came in and pushed everything back to October. But I'm on stage with Andrew Young, C.T. Vivian from the Freedom Rise, I'm on stage with Al Sharpton and uh, Jesse Jackson. And then as I'm, I was invited there to do some of I have a dream. And while I'm doing a speech, I could look to my left. And there was Dr. King's family. It was Martin King III. It was Bernice King. It was his sister, Christine King Ferris. And while I was giving that speech, uh, Gary, I tell especially young people when I go out and speak, I said, I got the biggest acknowledgement when I was doing, getting to that part, free at last. When I was getting down to that, I looked over and his son, Martin III, did like this. Put his thumb up. I said, oh, I've, I've, I've reached the promised land now. So that was just amazing. And um, I, I've had the opportunity to keynote for Governor Cuomo up in New York and so many other opportunities. And it's just a way of keeping the dream alive. And you know as well as I do that as his uh, fraternity brother, we have the obligation to make sure that that happens. So thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I'd actually like to just kind of piggyback off of what um, Reverend Dr. Moore said. So, um, Professor Lynn, in your opinion, what can we do to keep Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream alive? Like, what can a person do, not just on Martin Luther King Day, but mm -hmm. like all throughout the year? Well, there's a number of things that we can do. We can continue to have programs like this, and I commend you and your organization for, for doing this. Um, and we could try as much as we can to redouble our efforts to live the creed that Dr. Martin Luther King 
<clears throat> is, is noted for. Uh, one of excellence, um, as uh, Reverend Moore in, in one of his reenactments was talking about what Dr. King was saying, we have to be the best that we can at whatever level of society that we are. Um, uh, one of the things uh, that I would also note, we as a society really gravitate and revolve around the I have a dream speech in 1963. And when you look at that speech, I mean, a powerful speech. I mean, I'm not in any way trying to uh, denigrate it or anything that was in it. But when we look at the speech, his dream that he articulates is just two or three paragraphs near the end of the speech. He starts off the speech with a delineation of the American nightmare, the nightmare that is experienced by uh, African Americans and other persons of color, and what we often forget other poor people who are white. Uh, Dr. King, when he was going, doing his uh, preparing for his um, Poor People's March, he was talking about the, the hollows of Appalachia as much as he was talking about the ghettos of Harlem. In that speech, Dr. King criticized police brutality twice. And what happened last year? We had a national uprising over the issue of abusive policing. There were 2,000 protests in all 50 states in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. So we need to do something about police brutality. He wanted something done in 63, and now what? You know, we're like 50, 60 years later and we're still talking about police brutality. In that speech, he also talked about voter suppression he said, we have to do something when the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in Harlem has nothing to vote for. And what did we see last year? Voter suppression. And it wasn't something that just happened in um, Georgia, which it did. Um, the Georgia officials are getting rightful uh, kudos for resisting efforts by the now ex-President Trump to throw the election in his favor illegally. But before, the election itself, those very same election officials improperly, in many argue illegally, eliminated 198,000 people from the voting rolls by saying that they didn't live uh, in the place where they lived. And under the law, if you eliminate somebody from the voting rolls by, on the claim that they are not living where they're registered to live, you have to check with the post office. And the post office has all the records. And that voter purge was done without checking with the post office. So on many levels, it was done illegally. So there are so many things that Dr. King spoke for that we're uh, uh, not even dealing with. And one last point on poverty. When we look at the cities of Minneapolis, where a lot of protests were around police brutality, we see that the Black, the rate of poverty among African Americans is 41% in Minneapolis. Minneapolis has the highest income inequity of any city in the United States. Kenosha, Wisconsin, Louisville, Philadelphia. Uh, we see very high levels of poverty and we need to do something about that. If America is, not if, but it is, the richest country on earth, we can do better. Children in America should not go to bed crying at night because they're hungry. This is this is true. Question for the speakers: um, in in making sure that the the dream stops becoming a dream and becomes a reality, I, I wonder if you can speak to the um, the tapestry of of participants in the um, marches with um, Dr. King. And then the as as it relates to the marches, the protests, um, you know, over the summer in, in response to the killing of George Floyd uh, and and many others of color. And I know that just watching the the footage on TV, the the complexions, the the diversity of people in support of um, the protesters was was really encouraging. Uh, and looking at the the reels from from the marches, you know, back in the in the '60s. Uh, it certainly was impressive, but I don't know if, if you have a sense for 
is is there progress there? Is is that tapestry improving? You know, going from those events in the '60s to where we are today. Yeah, if I, if I could start, Doctor Washington. You know, uh, we refer back to these speeches, right? So one of the most powerful statements he made in the "I Have a Dream" speech is he looked at the quarter of a million people. He said, "The marvelous new militancy, which has engulfed the Negro community, must not lead us to a distrust of all white people." For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny and their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And so, you know, as I watched the Black Lives Matter movement and I looked at the, the beauty of what that represented, you know, all of a sudden, Dr. King's words again become absolutely relevant to today. Because when, when we come down to statements like when he said injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, we're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So, you know, he's constantly and then, you know, of course, his famous statement that we should not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. And so, uh, you know, I had did a uh, presentation last week for the Washington, D.C. National Archives about 3,000 children, and they were asking that same kind of question. They were saying, you know, well, what is the, what, what do you, do you think, and I was in character the whole time, so I was Dr. King. You know, one kid said to Dr. King, when you got killed, I said, I'm here today, I didn't get killed, you know, so, yeah, but, but the, they asked that question. They said, you know, what do you think of the Black Lives Matter movement? And I said, it was one of the most beautiful pictures of something that I had always visioned. And that is that you saw people of every color out there realizing that they're caught in this inescapable network of mutuality, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We're all brothers. Uh, to close on that, I've been really emphasizing this principle Dr. King spoke about called the beloved community. And in that beloved community, it's colorblind. That beloved community is all about humanity. It's about destroying poverty. It's about destroying racism. It's about destroying homelessness. And it's about living in harmony as brothers and sisters. And so, you know, when we saw what happened after, especially after the George Floyd situation, you know, now all of a sudden this thing was broadcast on television in front of everybody. And people were highly disturbed because they didn't see just a, a black man who had a knee on his throat, but they actually saw a human being who was just, unjustifiably losing his life and we all have to do something and I, I think that was what galvanized so many people so I think Dr. King could look down from heaven and see this massive group of people of all races marching together for the same cause uh, would have brought great delight to him and I think going forward uh, with this new generation of young people we're going to see a lot more of that. As lawyers say, I, I will incorporate by reference uh, Dr. Moore's response. I can't say too much more than that. One of the themes that Dr. King had said throughout his life was the need for all races to come together to make America be what you see on paper. I, I, and I, I'm mangling you, you. You're much better at <laughs> quoting Dr. King in voice than I am. But uh, yesterday, uh, last, last year with the uh, post uh, George Floyd killing uh, protest, we were at an, uh, yet another moment in America where there was a recognition that we must come together and live as one, as brothers and sisters, or we'll perish. And the problem has been, we come to these moments cyclically, and then we fall back. And we must find a way to sustain that momentum because that's the only way that we're going to effectuate real and lasting change. Yes, I think that is a wonderful statement. And that's something that I constantly wonder like how can we effectuate lasting change what can we do like is there like almost like people would have like those like bracelets like what would jesus do like do we get braces for everyone like what would mlk do <laughs> as like a continual and constant reminder i felt like there was some hope yesterday 
seeing the inauguration and the new president talking about unity, but I wish that people would incorporate that into their lives. Do you have any like recommendations for how to just naturally emulate that like throughout, just like as a value? You know, I um, one of the statements I make in all the schools I go to and prisons and I take the dream and I turn it into an acronym. And, and the D is for being dedicated, given everything you've got to make things better. The R is resilient. Don't let your challenges overcome you. The E is enthusiasm. Wake up every day with excitement to make a difference in the world. The A is attitude. A positive attitude can cause chain reactions to great things. And the M is motivated. And so what's, what's powerful there is that I've gone back to places where I've spoken and the kids can actually recite that. They say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm there to teach anyway. And I say, they say dream, you know, they, 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 they've now made their own presentation. So they want to impress me and they'll come and they'll say dream, dedicated, resilient, enthusiastic, having the right attitude and being motivated. I said, whoa, you know, and, and if, can you imagine that? They lock that into not only their mind, but it's a value within their spirit. You know, now all of a sudden they treat people differently and they act differently. They realize their social responsibility and they do all they can to preserve the dream of not only Dr. King, but even for their own peers to treat everybody as a human being. So I, I think, you know, I don't know if we're going to go with the bracelet with that, but but I think you, you just continue to just etch these values within people about loving one another. You know, I, I close on this one of, one of Dr. King's greatest sermons that I've ever heard was called Loving Your Enemies. And he explained this from two perspectives, the, the practical how to love your enemy and the theoretical why you should love your enemy. And so I try to, I, I've been writing a lot of articles on that kind of stuff. And you go back and you read those things and you realize that regardless of race, hatred is just eroding as a cancer. And we have to learn to eliminate certain things that are not right. If we do that, you know, then we'll be living in the world that God intended for us to live in. Sometimes I do, I stop myself and I think about, it's a, um, a quote and he talks about darkness and how mm -hmm. light can only get rid of the darkness. And sometimes when I'm online and someone says something and I want to respond, I just think like, am I being the light? <laughs> and I'm like, I am not being the light. I'm going to actually uh, log out now. <laughs> Does oh. anyone? have any uh questions because i have more but i don't want to like take over <laughs> i have a question um so thank you both so much um for your insights this has been really wonderful um and so it's you know very apparent that both of you have dedicated a lot um of your studies um to the life of mlk and you know his teachings and i'm curious if there or if you can narrow down something that um, is still a mystery to you or something that you still have questions about, or you know, if you could clarify something with him, um, what that would be. Well, just as someone who's um, looked at Dr. King's life in the Philadelphia area for a long time, I'm just amazed that so many things are still being discovered today um, mm -hmm. or over the last couple of years. Uh, I noted that the confirmation of Dr. King's attendance of the lecture of Mordecai Johnson, we just mm -hmm. came upon that information in January, February of last year. Wow. The narrative that um, of the Maple Shade protest that Dr. King was just driving down the road and, oh, let's stop for a sandwich and a beer. That really doesn't make any sense. And I'll give you something in terms of why there's a need to continue to study. That narrative is seemingly divorced from the reality of the time. Let's understand that in 1950, America was still practicing in a very ugly way, apartheid. Mm -hmm. Segregation ruled the roost. So here we have two learned individuals and Reverend King and Reverend McCall coming from Atlanta they knew what discrimination was. They knew what racism was. They knew where it could be injurious to your health or ending your life if you ended up in the wrong place. So here's my point. We all saw or heard of the movie a couple of years ago called The Green Book, right? That uh, it was the, what is it? The Negro, the Negro Motorist Green Book, 
Mm -hmm. When you look at the Negro Motorist Green Book for 1949, which you can find online, the, it's either the Schomburg or the New York uh, um, Library System has it online. If you look at New Jersey, you find that there are five cities, including Camden, that are really in the close proximity to Camden that are listed in that book as safe places to go, including an area called Lawnside, which was a historically black city founded by runaway uh, slaves. So would King and McCall and Pearl Smith not know about the Green Book? That's possible, but not probable. So they went there with the specific purpose of doing a protest, but historians say, eh, we're not gonna dig in that far. So there is a constant need to continue to do more research. And I have to just make this admission. Uh, when King was assassinated, I was a, a senior in high school and I saw the national unrest. It just tore my neighborhood apart. I, I grew up in Pittsburgh. At the time, you know, many of us fashioned ourselves as young militants. Um, we were just probably more crazy than we were coherent, but we really didn't understand King. And as I grew older and examine more of his life, I saw the militancy that he did, but it was in a militancy in a way slightly different than Malcolm X, but they were still pushing for the same thing, although pushing from different angles. So there's a continuous need, I'm sorry to be rambling here, but there's a continuous need to examine this man's life and his legacy, learn from it, but also to implement the lessons. Yeah, and to, to add to that, you know, I look back at that, remember the uh, monument you showed in Maple Shade? Mm -hmm. At the top of it was that quote that says, there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must take it because conscience tells him it is right. So what, what, what I would want to know is how did Dr. King maintain his focus and determination in times of such threat and, 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 and what could have been an amazing fear. Because, you know, I, I always look at from a conspiracy standpoint, Dr. King died April 4th, 1968. In June of 1969, his brother was found drowned in a swimming pool. And a lot of people don't, don't know that. And then also, I think it was 1973, that while his mother was on the piano at Ebenezer Baptist Church playing the Lord's Prayer, a visitor stood up right in church and shot her right in the church and killed her. So these, this, these things were, it's, he was constantly around all of these threats that even continued after he was gone. And so, you know, my thing would be, how do you maintain such a level of courage to still stand up when you're getting constant phone calls of death threats, not only to yourself, but the threats to your family. And that, that in itself would amaze me to find out how he was able to be so, so strong in such situations. Well, not only that too, I think also um, just advocating for nonviolence and getting young men and women ready for a protest in which they were going to um, sustain harm to themselves and to be standing there and to tell these people like, no, you can't fight back that I can't imagine. <laughs> like the, I think he is one of, if not the greatest leaders of our entire time. I think he should be, I mean, intricately studied. And I mean, y'all y'all heard me, right? I um I do these speeches, but I'm from North Philly. So if somebody was <laughs> not nah, let me stop because you're not Philadelphia is this. No, nah, you hit me, I'm coming back after you. But no, in reality, it it it's it's almost inconceivable the courage that the young people were able to exhibit in times of such violence and retaliation that they didn't swing back. It was amazing. Is there anything from his speeches that you would say that you find like a common um, a common thread, like something that you think is part of his leadership that he was continually pushing and driving forward? You know, um, a lot of people got to remember, you know, he was Dr. Martin Luther King, but he was Reverend 
Dr. Martin Luther King first. He was a preacher before he was a civil rights fighter. And so in a lot of his speeches, he really gets into a lot of real strong theological principles. And this one uh, sermon that he preached on is so applicable to today. It's called Rediscovering Laws Values. When he talks about the problem with man is that he has allowed the means by which he lives to outdistance the spiritual ends for why he lives. And then he, uh, he, he emphasized two great principles that all reality hinges on moral foundation and that all reality is under spiritual control. Meaning that, you know, there are spiritual laws that are just as abiding as the physical laws of nature. And that, you know, there is also a God that's in control. And when you violate those types of things, there is just, it's just as injurious as like violating the law of gravity. So, you know, he constantly spoke about the spiritual aspect of things. And that's what made me gain such an interest in him is because I was really in ministry uh, as I really started to study him. And you kind of see the correlation between everything he did, all in his speeches, is that when he met, when he spoke, he also ministered to people. So it was, it was a common element that I constantly would see. Is that, I love that. Do you have a link to that or the name for that? What's that? Look that up. Read the well, you just referenced how he was um, aligning like spirituality. Oh, that's just me saying that. I mean, I, that's yeah. that's what I truly believe. Um, I, I would I would suggest this though. I listen to all of those sermons and everything. If you this is this is pre Montgomery Buck boycott. It's called Rediscovering Lost Values. He doesn't even have the baritone in his voice yet because he's only 25 years old. But the but he was brilliant, you know, he was like brilliant. And when you listen to him talk about these things in 1954, and then you look at what we're dealing with in 2021, things haven't changed. And until we really get it, then we're gonna to continue to go through this cycle of, of, of a downward spiral until we really come together as a brotherhood. But I'll, I'll, I'll look, I might find something like that for you, so. Yeah, I just, I, I looked it up. There's a PDF called uh, Risk and Lost Values. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. And you then gotta hear, but to get the recording, you got to hear them teach it. And you mentioned that you write articles as well. Do you have anything like re resources or references? I would love for you to, um, it was just recently on Martin Luther King Day, the Delaware State News. It's an opinion section. And I wrote a little short, blurb on what's called advancing the beloved community you should read you should check that out i've been speaking about that and it's, it's dealing with those two sermons rediscovering lost values and and loving your enemies you know because if we don't do that if we don't rediscover the values of what we were here for and learn to love our enemies we're just that we're just in debt we're going to be destitute to just continue to just go down so check you can check that out yeah, I'm trying to find it. Oh, right here. I'm going to share it in the comments if anyone is interested in um, checking it out. My internet's just running slow. Now, now, I don't know about the Dr. Washington. He's a lot deeper than that article. <laughs> and then we're just going to be wrapping up here. We have like a minute left. So would you guys like to thank you, by the way, for everything that you shared today. I love how you made DREAM an acronym. That's amazing. <laughs> And would you like to share any like closing thoughts? Um, or we can all just have Dr. Just... Washington, I leave that to you. Well, well no, I, I just want to thank, uh, thank your organization for uh, making this uh, opportunity available. And I, uh, I want to also thank uh, Reverend Moore. <laughs> I'm really impressed. And this has been enlightening and uh, energizing for me, this, this, whole, yeah. this whole experience. Yeah. And just leave you with King's words. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, crawl, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep on moving. Oh, I love that guy. <laughs> wow. He is something else. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Yeah, 06.